Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think is finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. Do you feel stuck, alone, or like you're not getting the type of results you think you deserve? You put in all the hard work in your life, relationships, and business, but things just aren't getting any better? I've been there. That's how I started. That's where I was. I kept trying and trying to improve my life, but nothing just seemed to give. I started to think that personal development was a joke. I felt like every month I was in the same place I was the previous month. But then I found something that just worked. I grew. My business grew. My relationships flourished. And everything around me just started to click. People started respecting me more, and I finally felt like I was becoming the man I wanted to be. I created a program to help guys get the same results in their life. Check out kfmline.com to learn how the Lion's Den can radically transform your life. Again, that's kfmline.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with David Wagner. He's a spiritual teacher, men's group leader, and proud father who has dedicated his life to the exploration of personal transformation and the author of the recent book, Backbone. All right, David, happy to have you here on the show. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) All right. And David, as you know, you mentioned that you've listened to a lot of episodes. So we start off every show with uh, some sort of quote saying just to kind of give us some direction for the rest of the show. What do you got for us? This quote is a really short one, but a really good one, which is, success is messy. I heard it from T. Harv Eker, but I don't know if it's his quote or not, but I just love that. Success is messy. Very seldom ever just a straight line to whatever success we're looking for. You know, I deal in personal development success, but whether it's business or relationships or whatever, you know, it, it's a slog back and forth, trial and error. And uh, if we just enter into whatever we're, we're doing with that perspective, it saves us a whole lot of suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, let's just, let's dive into your journey. I, I think, yeah, uh, I think the success is messy. I think we're going to hear some of those uh, challenges come up in your story here. So David, take the mic here, share with us how you got started with what you do. How does one become a spiritual teacher, a men's group leader, and what led you to want to dedicate your life to personal transformation? (laughs) Yeah. Well, (laughs) I'm 44 now. I just turned 44. And I've been doing this stuff professionally since I was about 25. But before that, you know, a lot of it comes from the mess, Um, just the mess of I grew up in the Midwest in, you know, a little town kind of alcoholic family. And by the time I was coming of age, I too was one of those kids. I was a little drug addict myself at that point and, you know, kind of like a little juvenile delinquent. Not a very happy kid. Didn't see a whole lot of possibilities in my life. I had older brothers that um, were also, you know, leading pretty dark lives. And through a series of what I can only call miracles, I ended up getting sober when I was 16. I was a junior in high school and I ended up going to AA. It turned out that Peoria, Illinois, where I'm from, has some of the coolest AA anywhere in the world that I've ever experienced. Now I've been sober for 27 years. And I just got this amazing introduction into spiritual life from just these hardcore older men, alcoholics, rough kind of redneck, you know, guys were some of my first teachers, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they introduced me to this beautiful combination of a really deep connection to spirit that's like a true connection to spirit along with a kind of brutally honest self-inquiry practice and just being able to fearlessly look at your bullshit 
<laughs> so then, you know, I got into the, the spirituality stuff. I just sort of found my calling, you could say. And by the time I went to college, I went to college in, in Chicago, a bigger city. I got turned on to more classical Eastern training, you know, in meditation and studying, you know, some of the Eastern wisdom traditions and, you know, worked with you know, spiritual masters and just kind of threw myself into that process. Um, and, and very early on in that, I heard a calling of my purpose to help other people. And I didn't know exactly what that was going to be, you know, when I was 21. Uh, but, you know, over the years, it has evolved into, you know, into what I do today. <laughs> so, you said fearlessly look into your bullshit. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's really deep. And I think it's something that oftentimes we put aside, you know, our bullshit. And, and we tend to look at other people's bullshit <laughs> and yeah. point fingers at them and want to help others. But like we all have our own bullshit. And yeah. so elaborate more on what that means and how guys can really tap into that. Well, you know, in the book, in just in general, in my teachings, I like to tune people into these, what I call the three keys to deep power and happiness. And one of them is to know your purpose and be on track with your vision. One of them is to have a deep and authentic spiritual connection. And the third one, and this is really the linchpin, Andrew, is the third key is to get free from your bullshit. It's important to say the way that I phrase that, um, get free from your bullshit. It doesn't mean to eliminate your bullshit because the bullshit is never completely eliminated. It's just that when I start working with a man, what we look at is we just look at what is the bullshit that they're really mired in. And it can be, you know, what I say, mental bullshit, body bullshit, or life bullshit, you know, like life dramas or relationships or work things, whatever. It, it, the bullshit that really matters is the bullshit that keeps us from those first two keys, you know, from following our purpose or knowing our purpose and also, you know, from having that deep connection with spirit. And so, you know, a lot of it is just the, the kind of stuff that they have you do in AA um, of doing sort of personal inventory work, just really looking and just saying, okay, here's my life and here's how I would like my life to be. And how is it? You know, what's, what's the shortfall there? You know, here's my vision for myself as a man and here's how I'm actually showing up. And, you know, what's, what's the difference there? And therein is what I call the bullshit because I just believe that every human being is a beautiful thing, you know, that every man is, is a glorious creature. And to whatever degree we're not living in a magnificent way, we're not being true. You know, in some way or another, we're living a lie or living a story that we heard from somewhere else or we're living in a wound. But that, you know, when we come into what our, and this is the essence of, of the Eastern teachings, really. But, you know, when we come into what we truly are, we're awesome. And, and so that's, that's where, we're, where we're trying to point people out of their bullshit and into the truth of their magnificence, you could say. I like that. And I appreciate where you say, come into who we truly are. What happens to guys when they're growing up to where, is it society? Is it family? What is it that really yes. beats guys up growing? Yes. And I, I don't, has it always been like this? Is it this just these last few generations? But there's, there's just so much happening to men today that they're growing up, not knowing who they are, not feeling, not knowing what it means to be a man, not feeling this whole idea of like the nice guy, I feel like all this is just intertwined. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's all of the above, you know, when you say society, family, but men today are raised in this environment where, you know, men don't have an Oprah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Any girl today, I have two kids. I have a boy that's three and I have a little girl that's, that's just about nine months. Any girl today is raised in an environment where there is just empowerment in the oxygen, you know, like any little girl today is guided to ask herself, what kind of woman will I be? 
And the subtext of that is don't be a disempowered one. Every girl is really like encouraged and supported to find her power, whatever that is, however that boys on the other hand, that because, you know, we lived in, I guess, patriarchal society for so long, the empowerment of males was just assumed, but now boys are just kind of raised. And the main thing for them is stay out of trouble and don't fail. And that's about it. You know, in terms of like thinking about who are your role models, you know, like what kind of man do you want to be? What does it mean to have qualities like honor and uh, strength and fearlessness and grit? These things that in past generations, they were just totally needed, you know, because you didn't have, you know, 5,000 friends on Facebook or whatever. You know, you had... 50 people that you spent your entire life around. Right. And so like your integrity and your strength and whatever, it was just how you showed it. Um, you had to do stuff like defend your property and put a roof on your house and you know, all that kind of stuff. So our modern world has, has created an environment where a boy can grow up on the couch and by society be called successful as long as he stays out of jail, doesn't hit anyone, and is able to have a job and make money. Mm, wow. Or even just playing video games. He grows up online. Yeah, yeah. He grows up online. He's got good grades. So his parents aren't going to, yeah. he's not really doing anything wrong. We can't, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he got accepted to college. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing everything right. Yeah. But yeah. But he's fucked. <laughs> yeah. His role models are his friends. And yeah. his friends, their role models is their friends. And yeah. it, it is causing this whirlwind of yeah. nice guys. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guys and just, you know, what I call mild men. The listeners can go to Facebook and we created a page called Wild Man or Mild Man. Mild Man. Okay. So explain yeah. the mild man <laughs> and then is the wild man... Is this something similar to uh, Iron John's Wild Man? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like it's a hat tip to Robert Bly. Got it. But yeah, it, it's basically the idea that what our natural state is, what our savage mm. state is, okay. is this empowered, robust, passionate, honorable, Primal. creative. Yeah, but okay. also very sophisticated and intelligent, you know, because we're not a Bigfoot. We're not a an ape. We're man. Um, so that's the wild man. And the mild man is this thing that we're describing, which is what we drift into. And this is the thing. And this is why I wrote the book. And this is why I'm doing this work now is that men have to go out of their way now to find their thump again. You know, they're not going to get their thump at the office. They're not going to get their thump from their life. Now, the caveat to that, and this is, this is the thing, I know you've got a lot of younger listeners and, you know, I think you probably have a lot of listeners my age too, but life is going to thump every man. <laughs> you know, by the time they get into their 35s and 40s and they've run out of the script that they, that they signed up for when they were in high school, um, they're going to start getting thumped. And then, man, they really need this work. Because then it's a matter of, okay, are they going to just start fading to black? You know, are they going to just start tuning themselves down for the rest of their life? Or at that midlife point, are they going to say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm 100% being and I'm only living at 40% life. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. What would the wild man how does this man live? Like, what are some examples of the wild man in something that we could just relate to in society today? Yeah. Well, you know, he rides a Harley Davidson and has a beard and throws a tomahawk. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was, um, I was, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, this, no. this might sound like you in uh, Ohio, <laughs> <or> just <laughs> in that canyon throwing tomahawks. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, that's the important thing. And, you know, what I really try to stress about, you know, all of the men's work that I'm doing these days is that every man's wild man is super unique. Mm. 
And for one man, it might mean riding a motorcycle or doing dangerous things or, or whatever. And for another man, it, it might take on a completely different vibration, you know, that isn't typically macho or that isn't typically, you know, like bear medicine kind of energy. And that, that's really important to say because, you know, we're definitely not trying to say that um, a wild man or an empowered man or a man with backbone looks a certain way on the outside, but rather it's the quality of how they're living their life. Ah, uh, I like that. I was recently watching a documentary of the skateboarder who jumped the Great Wall of China on his skateboard. Uh-huh. Um, that, that would be a, probably an example of the wild man in his form. Maybe Elon Musk, an entrepreneur trying to go into space and trying to build rockets. Uh, you know, someone I recently came from a music festival and there was this kid, uh, Martin Garrix, who was on stage, you know, just going nuts on stage, like absolutely just just put on such a great show. And, you know, just different avenues, different platforms of expressing uh, the wild man. Yeah. And let me throw in a couple other ones. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, like one of my sort of older men in my circle is uh, this man, Robert Kushner. He's a very successful painter. And, you know, he is, he's become famous as a painter, uh, painting these beautiful flowers. Literally, he paints g- like gilded flower paintings that are the most feminine images you could possibly imagine. And he himself, you know, doesn't have like a typically macho bone in his body, mm. but that man has thump. You know, okay. he's a he's a grandfather. He's a successful painter. You know, he paints the fuck out of those golden flowers. You know what I mean? And, and then like a completely different flavor that it's important to say is, is my friend George, who works for the MTA, you know, like the subways in New York and manages a crew of guys that, that okay. work on the tracks. And yeah. He's got five kids and he lives in a house out in the suburbs and you know, he just goes to work and does a great job every day and isn't particularly passionate about subway tracks, but he's a great manager to his men and he's passionate about being a father and a husband and he's living his wild man. You don't have to be an entrepreneur, in other words, or to embody this. You know, oftentimes a man will find his thump like right there under, under his feet, if that makes sense. Mm. Okay. I have a, a really good idea of the wild man. And there's different ways to express your wild man. There's not just one way. And I, I really like that. I, I think that's a really good point to make because oftentimes, like you kind of joked about earlier, it's like, ah, oh, this, you know, Harley Davidson, you have to yeah. be this badass and you got to get tattoos. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. so I like that a lot. Like every guy can have their own version of that wild man, but the key is to, is to tap into that. And so we gave good examples of the wild man. I think the listeners can associate themselves with some of those characters. What about the mild man? What, yeah. how, how does that, how do, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, on the outside, Andrew, it could look like any of those examples that we just said. Mm. Because again, we're talking about an internal game here. So that same man who's just like going to his nine to five and bringing home the bacon for his family, he might be doing that under duress. You know, he might be doing that just because he doesn't know what else to do or he's afraid to not do it. Right. And so could the person who's doing this big entrepreneurial thing with space or jumping the the great wall. In in the book, I talk about this Lakota word, which is wicha, which means a complete man. And the Agla Lakota people would use this word to describe a man like Crazy Horse, you know, somebody who is a very esteemed leader, excellent in whatever he does, but also, you know, super strong in his word, lots of honor, also generous, also loving, you know. So it's hard to tell by looking at somebody's public image what's really going on under the surface. But the mild man, the experience of it, is really within their heart and just really into like how weak their thump is, I call it is, you know, if they really feel like they're living their truth or if they feel like they're in some way or another, like living in the closet. I have a a gay friend, Gregory, who is uh, just this brilliant man. 
And uh, when I was going through a big transition in my life, I was coming out of a marriage and it was this big blow up in my life. Um, he said, yeah, you're coming out of the closet. He said, you know, gay men aren't the only ones who get to come out of the closet. <laughs> and I just love that. And, and that's what I find is I work with men and they make that movement maybe from the wild or from the mild man to the wild man, that it's like they sort of realize, whoa, I've been living a lie to some extent. You know, whether it's being the nice guy, as you said, or whatever that is. And who I really am is this whole other being. And, you know, first, just like a, a gay man, first just recognizing it within themselves and then slowly, slowly moving toward having a full expression of, of who they are. So it's clear that the wild man is the direction that I think most guys want to go into. And, and by thump, just to recap, you're saying yeah. thump, like, is this like that kind of inner gusto, like that energy inside? What do you mean exactly by that yeah. thump? Thump has two aspects to it. It has an, there's an internal thump, there's like an inward facing thump, and there's an outward facing thump. So the inward facing thump is what you're saying. It's like that feeling of, um, you know, like, fuck yeah, whether it's dinner with my family, fuck yeah. <laughs> Taking the recycling down to the recycling place. Fuck yeah. Or if it's like, you know, talking to Andrew Farabee about backbone. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. You know, <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the internal thump. The external thump is our impact and our influence that we have on our world. And again, that world can be the world, you know, for somebody that, that has some, some sort of work that they're doing with the world. But our world can also just be our family. It can be our pet, you know, it can be our home. But that a man with thump is able to translate their goodness through action with excellent effect. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, success is messy that excellence oftentimes takes a lot of trial and error, and that's where we need all these warrior qualities of grit and stick to itness. But that ultimately, you know, I try to coach men. We're not trying to be perfect, but we are trying to be excellent because that's what our truth is. We mm. are excellent. Mm. So there's an internal thump and an external thump. Yeah, that was good. I'm glad I clarified on that. I just I was feeling it was like, is he talking about energy? And so back to the mild man and the, the wild man. So how can someone break through? What process can someone undergo? What kind of questions can a mild man ask himself uh, to really start going into the direction of the wild man? Just a really, really basic question is just how happy am I really? The basic thing that underlies all of my teachings is this, this simple thing. And it, it, you know, if you're not careful, it can seem like a tagline, but it's, you deserve the best of life and life deserves the best of you. And it's nice. It looks good on a postcard. But man, if you really dig into that like a Zen koan, those are two very deep reflection points. In my course that I do for men online, the first exercise is they go through 10 areas of their life and they give themselves a score, you know, from one to 10 on how much is this the best? My romantic relationships, my work, my relationship with money, my sex life, my relationship with spirit. There's 10 of them. And, um, you know, if you really deserve the best, you know, where are you at? And then they come up with an overall score. And man, just looking at that score, um, it's something for a man to, to really look at that in a, in a brutally honest way. And then we just get to work on if you're able to give your best to life, then that score can really be increased. So I'm assuming for a lot of guys, you're saying be brutally honest that that score is lower than what they often yeah. thought yeah. Is, is the case. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, for a lot of our listeners that are listening to us right now, they're already 10 steps ahead because they're listening to this podcast. They're into evolution they're into Tim Ferriss and all this other kind of stuff. But a lot of the men that I reach out to and really who I'm, I'm trying to reach out to with this book too, are like just men that have been completely left out of what I call the Oprah Chopra self-help revolution. 
Yeah. Where like their wives are going to weekends and reading magazines and taking quizzes about their happiness factor and all this stuff. And the men are just sitting at home, you know, watching porn and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a good topic. Let's, let's talk about porn. <laughs> it's something that uh, is really, I've written this article and it, it was like one of the most popular articles on the topic of porn. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting. Porn is I, popular, man. Porn is the, you yeah. know. It's interesting. I look at data, like I look at the analytics of that article and I could see where the traffic is coming from. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, the majority of that traffic, it's not coming from this country. It's coming from uh, South Korea, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and, and a lot of other Asian countries. But uh, with all that said, something to think about here is for the first time in all of human history, men have access to this instant yeah. gratification of porn. But for the first yeah. time in all yeah. of the world, any type of women, any type of scenario. And now it's like, I'm seeing that they're coming out with virtual reality yeah. and it's in like, they're just pouring more and more money <laughs> into this. And yeah. uh, it's like, it's only gonna get closer and closer to the real thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this isn't exactly about porn, but one of the companies that I work with is Yoga Glow, where I have a bunch of sort of guided meditation videos. And they're awesome people, awesome, awesome company. Um, if you want to like get yoga or meditation, that's a good thing to check out. But I was at their offices and uh, one of the tech guys, you know, was really, he was like this young guy and he wanted to show me this virtual reality thing. And I put on this headset and, oh, gosh. you know, it's like, I was just like in this kind of room and then the room turned into outer space and there were just these shapes floating around and stuff. And, and he was like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's so realistic and it's so cool. And it's so, and I just said to him, you know, kind of an asshole, but I said to him, I was like, you know what I think is really cool is the universe and reality. <laughs> I said, it's totally realistic and it's really awesome. Like life. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Hey, but when you put this on, we can put you around the corner in the street yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. you'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, like the, the porn thing, the <laughs> it's a dicey thing. I mean, there's one of the things is that, you know, when I was in my spiritual training, one of the things that we would practice is in Sanskrit, what they call brahmacharya, which is where you're not only celibate in terms of you're not having sex with people, but you're also, you're not masturbating and you even follow a diet regimen to try to prevent having wet dreams and like losing any semen at all. And it's really well known in, in India and in China and a lot of the esoteric traditions that a man's sexual fluid is super potent spiritual energy source. And, um, you know, I practiced that for, for several years. Years? Is, wow. Yeah, yeah, as best I could. Yeah, in my 20s, actually. Wow, this um, is... Uh, <laughs> as crazy wow. as yeah. that is. That's and I can remember, you know, like having a wet dream and waking up in the morning and be like, damn, I got to start all over. I was saving that up for, you know, five months, <laughs> but it almost like gives you superpowers. You mm -hmm. know, it makes your meditation super strong. It just makes your mind a lot keener and your senses. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So just looking at that and just looking at how <laughs> much men are jizzing these days, you know, like if the statistics about porn weren't just about downloads, but they were just, you know, measured in gallons of jizz. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, but like have increased in the ex, like the jizz export factor, you know, in the past you know, 20 years. We, we just it's, lost some listeners. <laughs> it's just skyrocketed. Yeah, it is. Oh, is it David Dida? He calls it like your life force. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. it's actually in Think and Grow Rich. Uh, yeah, Na yeah. Napoleon Hill has a chapter yeah. on, uh, I forget exactly what he called it, yeah. sexual transmutation. I yeah. think he called it that. Yeah. But basically saying that this is your energy, like this yeah. is your focus, like this is, it's very powerful and don't just put it out because you're bored. And I think that's what porn is doing. It's like, oh, I'm bored. Like, I could just look at this really hot girl, get railed. So I'll do that. And then you're like, you know, I won't masturbate. And then you masturbate. <laughs> and, it's and, and, the, yeah, and the other dangerous thing about it, as I see from the point of view that I do with men, is that, and, and this is what I say, I don't have anything against porn. You know, I, that's great. If that's part of somebody's, you know, sexual life, whatever, fantastic. Um, but it's just, I always just ask men, so if you enjoy porn, I just want you to look at your actual sex life and see how it adds up. 
to that and just see how much you're vicariously living through the porn. Um, and for that matter, through the action movie, through that matter from the video game or whatever, I just think that there's just a thing where men and people, and especially guys, you know, what I call guys, they're sort of like man-aged boys or, you know, like guys as opposed to men. They live very vicariously. They're just always looking at a screen um, you know, like you can look at the pictures of this canyon where I live and they're beautiful and you can kind of get an idea of it, but you can't smell, mm. you know, the sun baking the sage, you know, you, you can't, you can't hear the sound of the wind and, and feel the energy of this, this sacred land. Yeah. Um, and just the same way, you know, like in porn, it, it's just like, it, it tricks the brain into thinking that, you know, you're, you're having this experience, but. Um, you know, I just, I just want men, you know, so great, you know, that turns you on to like, to see that kind of a scene in a porn scene. Well, can you go make that a reality in your bedroom? You know, can you go and have that kind of robust sex life? You know, so it turns you on to see, you know, somebody like really expertly driving a car or whatever, you know, well, you know, how can you get a piece of that for yourself? Yeah. I like that. Gave that example earlier of, of the real world is, is even better. <laughs> yeah. <And> like, <laughs> it's like even, is, it's even <laughs> the thing is, Andrew, people are hungry, you know, men are, men are hungry to, to like feel their thumb and, and they, and so, you know, if there's a way that they can go online and shoot 20 people and save the day and blow shit up and fly helicopters and, and then go to a porn site, they're hungry to get that. And so then that's just something that the marketplace has made readily available. And what I do is I try to really honor that hunger in men and help them actually find that hunger, even to the point where it makes them uncomfortable and then get out of their computer room and like go out in life and like actually press themselves into the physicality of life and get some of that. But definitely, I don't want to. I, de I definitely just want to underscore not to shame the hunger, not to shame that like primal hunger to like you know ravage women and slay your enemy and all that stuff. I think that's <laughs> hardwired in us, and that's right. a part of our beauty as men. Right. It's just you know, let's go out there and like actually get some of that. Absolutely. And for the porn, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to watch porn, but if it is a problem in a man's life and you most likely know if it is, <clears throat> if you have an excess amount of video files on your computer or if you're constantly downloading and you know all the websites, you know all the girls, then it may be a, a problem. Then I would say you don't need to cut it out from your life completely, but acknowledge it and slowly start reducing it and start going out into the real world and trying to create that for yourself. Yeah. Just seeing what it tells you about yourself. Yeah. Really, yeah. really good uh, conversation here on <laughs> porn and masturbation. Let's, <laughs> you know, it, everyone does it though. It's like every, I, I remember I used to feel when I was younger, like, Oh, I'm the only one who does this. But as yeah. I started to get older, it's like every guy, uh, yeah. you know, every guy has their own folder uh, titled taxes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's let's now jump into the knowledge round. I'm just going to ask you some rapid fire questions here, David. Okay. Do you feel stuck, alone, or like you're not getting the type of results you think you deserve? You put in all the hard work in your life, relationships, and business, but things just aren't getting any better. I've been there. That's how I started. That's where I was. I kept trying and trying to improve my life, but nothing just seemed to give. I started to think that personal development was a joke. I felt like every month I was in the same place I was the previous month. But then I found something that just worked. I grew, my business grew, my relationships flourished, and everything around me just started to click. People started respecting me more and I finally felt like I was becoming the man I wanted to be. I created a program to help guys get the same results in their life. Check out kfmline.com to learn how the Lion's Den can radically transform your life. Again, that's kfmline.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives, starting in three, two, one, showtime. All right, first question I have here is, what advice would you give to a guy who's feeling really lost or unsure of what they should do with their life? Get with other men. Find men that you can trust and that you can have intimate conversations with. That's the short answer to that one. 
good. by another man. Yep. Yeah, good. And, and what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? Part of it was time. Part of it was was just, you know, life. And I, I just needed to have my, my balls drop in a certain way. Because, you know, I had all the information. You know, I, I studied Robert Bly and all that was in a men's group when I was in college. But it was really once I got into my 30s and you know, had a divorce under my belt and had a kid along the way that it really kind of forced me to, to reach up in there and, and, and pull them out and do this work. So it was really like life circumstances was, was what was holding me back. Mm, okay. And can you share with us uh, an experience that you can really vividly remember of you being the wild man at your best? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, what comes to mind? The one that you thought of and you're like, no, I shouldn't say that one. That's well, that's- yeah, it's, it's right now, right now, man, it, it's me sitting in this office. We just moved into this house two weeks ago. Okay. I blew up my life in New York city and cause I just wanted to raise my kids out in nature. And, um, you know, we just launched this book and getting ready for this book tour. I'm doing a book tour on my motorcycle and I'm just in the midst of this big, scary, unknown. Yes. I'm, I'm swinging the bat at, at this whole thing. I'm talking to Andrew Farabee. It's this moment right now, bro. How does it feel? You moved, you're out in nature. You told me uh, where you lived. I was looking at pictures and you're just like, when you're just out there in nature, like, have you seen Into the Wild? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Right now you're that kid on standing on top of the bus, just like, yeah. ah. <laughs> yeah, man. I listen to Eddie Vedder as I'm riding my motorcycle through the canyon and stuff. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds, like yeah. you're, it sounds like you're living. Yeah, I totally, totally. And, and I was when I was in New York, too. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I believe in integrated spirituality and what I realized was that living in New York, the integration was much more of a warrior integration of mm. getting out there, getting through the obstacles, you know, getting through the, the, you know, getting through life. Whereas here, it's more like of a king energy integration where it's like, this is the way that I want it. And it's just a matter of just, you know, kind of embracing the opulence. And the other thing that I always say, I should say, along with uh, get with other men, you know, it's like things that I tell every man to do is get out into nature and, you know, put yourself into the closest wilderness that you have around you in silence, in a reflective mode. And that is going to show you so much about yourself as a man. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Can you name someone who's had a large impact on your life, like a mentor? Uh, oh, man. And why? just one? <laughs> I have so many. Uh, yeah, one that comes to mind. Why, why and how has this person, person impacted your life? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll just I'll I'll say Norm Jager, Norman Jager. He was one of my first spiritual teachers, you could say. And he was my girlfriend's dad when I got sober back in Peoria. And he was a he was a Christian pastor who had kind of given up the the mainstream church and started this little mission because he believed that Christ's message was to really help the the least fortunate people. And he decided that the least fortunate people that he could work with were people who were like, had Down syndrome and were institutionalized for like really serious, like cerebral palsy and birth defects and old people that had been abandoned in nursing homes. And he started this, this mission where he got all these buses and got some of his Christian brothers together and they would go and um, just pick these people up every Sunday and feed them these amazing meals and minister to them in this really beautiful way and sing for them and then continue to take care of them, you know, during the week too. And I can remember we would take them out to a movie every once in a while and uh, we would just take over the movie theater you know, with all of these, and it would always be a comedy, you know, just all these different kind of bodies and wheelchairs and people with different kind of mental disabilities and stuff. And um, if you get 20 people with Down syndrome <laughs> together to watch like a stupid Jim Carrey movie or something, man, is it just outrageous situation. But the way that he was a, an influence to me he never wanted me to profess being a Christian or anything, but he taught me about 
service, even when you don't feel like it. And he taught me about, he heard his calling and he followed it to the nth degree. I mean, he just completely followed his purpose and his passion and he made good money. He was a power tool salesman. He, he was like a door, you know, like a traveling salesman. But he put all of his money into this mission and he just died such a beautiful, happy man. I have a picture of myself, you know, as like this punk 18 year old trying to get sober, sitting there at a picnic table with, with him and some of these folks. And um, he was a huge, huge influence to me. Mm, yeah. and, and one of my first influences. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And now, David, what are your three most influential books that have helped you on your journey and, and why? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to ask me this, so I, I thought about this ahead of time. It got good. <laughs> One of them is is definitely Think and Grow Rich. Mm. You know, uh, that's a, uh, you know, because I'm kind of thinking about ones that would be re- relevant for your listeners. Too. Uh, share Share what you got. Like, you know, you. That's what uh-huh. we want. Okay, well, all of Hunter S. Thompson's books when I was a kid, <laughs> actually, were super influential to me because it, it just kind of gave me this this vision of a totally different kind of different different kind of man. Is a spiritual book, uh, "Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism" by Trungpa Rinpoche, is a huge one. Three that I, I want to say for for men is uh, besides mine, of course. Is read read Iron John. Yeah. You know, it's it's not that easy to get through. It's very deep and, and can get really wooly and philosophical, but at least try to read Iron John. And then recently I love Mark Devine's book, The Way of the Seal. Yeah. And I love uh, uh Ryan Holiday's book, The Obstacle is the Way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, just as, as recent books, but I could, I could go on and I'm just looking at my bookshelf right now. There's so many. Yeah. Yeah. Really good books. I, yeah. I've, I've gone through those books there and Ryan Holiday's book, especially has been helping me through, through my own like health, yeah, health challenge. Like For the sure. obstacle is the way, <laughs> just like for the sure. obstacle is the way. All right. And scenario here for you. This is the scenario. <laughs> One of the most popular questions of the show here is <laughs> imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20 year old self, David, what would you tell him to do? And what would you tell him not to do? Well, first of all, I would just take him and just hold him and just let him feel a man's nurturing, but also masculine and powerful love and just let him feel that in his body because he had never felt that. And it wasn't until he really felt love from men that he was able to make this big movement that we're talking about. And, And then I would just tell him to just make more mistakes and not be afraid to fuck up and just tell them, you know, success is messy. More than anything, if I only had 60 seconds, I would just take him and just hold him so deeply and just let him feel that, that masculine love. Is that weird? No, I think it's very unique as the first person, I think, to say that. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, that says a lot. I think that's what we need is more people who say different yeah. things. What would you tell them not to do, if anything? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much I want to say right here, but, <laughs> but it's more like, like it would be things more in the realm of not hold back. Okay. You know, there are a couple of decisions that I would have asked him to, to take a little bit more counsel from other people about, but, um, but more so it's more like not hold back and, you know, and, and not doubt, not doubt himself so much. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. I, th- I think this is uh, different insights here. And just now to reflect back on, let's say, where you were in AA, if you can remember, were you the one who was passing the coffee along or <laughs> uh, yeah, just I- remembering, remembering those days through the journey that you've undergone and now leading you know, men's groups and written a book and coaching guys and helping guys online and offline and really making a difference in people's lives. As yeah. you, as you already know, I mean, these guys have shared those experiences with you. Yeah. What, what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? And it's really in that koan that I said before is that you deserve the best of life and life deserves the best of you. Mm. That life is this magnificent, creation of spirit 
it's just so magnificent. Like every minute that we get to be alive and just be interacting with life, I believe is a deep gift. And also you, you know, each one of you, each man, each human being is also this amazing, beautiful thing. And that where we fall short is when we aren't paying attention to those two, what I believe are inalienable truths. Mm. Yeah, just taking a moment to kind of reflect on that. That's really good, deep. All right. And to always remember your death is galloping towards you faster and faster every day. Yeah, and just to touch on the topic of death, I think all too often we think and feel that we're all guaranteed a full life to yeah. what is that? 80, 85, 90. Yeah. I don't know. What is something up there? And we think yeah. if we're 20, we think, oh, you know, I, I get to live 60 more years. If we think yeah. we're in our fifties, we go, oh, you know, I get another 30, 40 years of life. Yeah. Like, but often the case is no one's guaranteed to live to the end. Your, yeah. your end could actually be in five years. It could be, yeah. in, it could be in 12 years. It could be, yeah. it could be next year. Yeah. And putting that into consideration, I think it really changes the frame of, of what a full life is and how to live and enjoy and be that wild man, uh, you know, with the life that the time that we have. Yeah. And, and the thing that Steve Jobs said, oh, like yeah. one of those last talks he gave, that it's not just that your life isn't that long, but it's that, you know, like it's this moment, like nothing's ever going to be as easy as it is right now. Okay, so I might live to be 85. Great. You know, in those last 10 years, I'm going to be 75 to 85. I'm never going to be as young as I am right now. I'm probably never going to be as like vibrant. We never know what's going to happen in the world to make things maybe more difficult than they are right now. You know, th that aspect of death too, just that our ego just gives us this false sense of permanence that you know, we have time to waste and, and, and energy to waste. And we just never know what's right around the corner. But, you know, whatever is in this moment right now is just begging us to just hurl ourselves into it with like all of our gusto. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I really do. Giving me some motivation for the day. Giving me yeah, some... Man. some <laughs> I'm excited uh, for what's happening next, but you know, back to you here. Like, what is exciting you today? You kind of alluded earlier that you're doing all this amazing, epic shit in your life. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. know, what's 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 getting you out of bed? Yeah, well, geez. Um, right now, we're focusing a lot on two things. One is we're going to be launching this podcast called the the Whole Manchilada, which is a podcast for men. Um, it, it's 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 not as kind of serious is knowledge for men. You could say we're going to have a little bit of this stuff, but you know, we're going to also have like movie recommendations and, you know, kind of silly stuff on there too. Um, it's going to be kind of entertaining, you know, as well as informative. And, um, this, this book tour, you know, where I, I am going to ride one of my motorcycles, one of my Harley Davidson's from New York city back here to California. And, um, just, you know, it's like a whistle stop tour, like a campaign or something where I'm going to stop at, at 13 different cities along the way and, you know, do signings for backbone and, and men's meetings and like almost like rallies with men and um, just bring out all kinds of men, you know, not just not just workshop dudes, but, you know, biker <laughs> like bikers and, you know, the husbands of all the women that have been coming to my workshops and. Um, yeah, we're going to like eat barbecue and, you know, have music and, and yeah, so we're, we're setting that tour up right now. And, um, and just, you know, after this, I'm going to ride my motorcycle down to one of these swimming holes here in the Canyon and, uh, just get in and, and jump into that icy cold water and see what happens after that. Yeah. Sounds like you're living the dream. Sounds like you're really living your purpose and, yeah. and it, you sound like you're really coming alive. And I think the audience can, can really just feel that through your voice. And yeah. that's, that's what that thump is right there. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> All right. 
David, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing with me your story, uh, being vulnerable here with my audience and giving us some really good deep insight, uh, giving us a lot of things to think about as we as we end the show here and as all the guys go on with the rest of their day. So this has been really good and I'm glad that you came on. Yeah, man. Well, thank you so much. This is this is an honor for me. Actually, uh, let me just, Jeremy, throw this in. We'll just keep it going. Yep. You guys can follow up with David at... DavidHWagner.com. Don't forget the H. DavidHWagner.com. And uh, on Facebook, it's Wildman or Mildman. And Instagram, it's Men's underscore Revolution. Um, check us out. I'd love to see you. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge From In podcast. Hundreds of interviews and a million downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement, and we've just started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review in iTunes. It really helps to grow the podcast. Guys, 2015 is the official year of living with purpose, where every day you do only the things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. Check out kfmfree.com to get free tools I've created to help you crush life. Again, that's kfmfree.com. This is your host, Andrew Fairby, and I'll see you in the next episode.